Good afternoon, folks. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome, welcome. Happy Tuesday, April 12th already. What is life? This is crazy. I can't believe it's already like halfway through April, but it's a beautiful day outside if you're in Ottawa. So I'm very grateful for the sun and it actually feels like spring today. So let's keep our fingers crossed that it stays that way. So welcome everyone. My name is Sam. Today we are joined by Emma Terrell who is also known as the urban botanist. And we are gonna learn about all things plants, plant care, how to become the best plant parent, which I certainly need some help with. I have a plant actually right here, I'll show you. Uh, that could use a little bit of help. Um, but then I also have other ones that are thriving. So I don't know, we need some help over here, folks. So I'm glad, I'm glad you're joining us for this. So before I hand the floor over to Emma, I'm just going to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, so first, this event is being recorded and will be available to watch on the AC Hub On Demand website in the coming days. If you need closed captioning, this event is equipped with closed captioning. You just press the CC icon along the bottom of your Zoom toolbar to enable the closed caption. If you have any comments, questions throughout the event today, please post them into the chat or into the Q&A. We will reserve a little bit of time at the end to answer questions while Emma will answer questions. Um, but also if you have any like pressing questions throughout the event, feel free to post them in the chat and Emma can answer them from there as well. Okay, folks, so I'm just going to quickly introduce Emma and then I will hand the floor over to her. So, like I said, spring is in the air today and it is time to grow our green thumbs. I certainly need some help with that, so I'm very happy to have Emma here today. Emma is the owner and creator of the Urban Botanist. Emma is an naturalist at heart and her desire to engage with nature and share her passion with others is what led her to create the Urban Botanist. And we will share all of Emma's links in the chat if you would like to connect with her and engage with her platform. Um, so I just want to thank you very much, Emma, for being here. We really appreciate having you. You've done a couple of workshops with us before, and you've always been so wonderful, such good vibes, and so, so informative. So we are very thankful to have you here, Emma. And we're going to hand the floor over to you now, Emma. Thank you for being here, and take it away. Thank you so much, Samantha, and equally thank you so much for having me. Um, I am just forever and beyond grateful every single time that I get to step behind the camera, behind the, the screen, and even in person as we're starting to kind of offer those uh, in-person events once again after a very long two and a half years. But I'm just so grateful to be spending the next hour with you lovely folks talking all things plants, obviously one of my favorite topics of discussion. Welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be spending the next hour chatting all things plants with you. Um, of course, my name is Emma. I am the Ottawa-based small business owner, uh, the urban botanist. You may have seen me online. I'm usually TikToking my way through TikTok, figuring that out. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on all the things. Uh, becoming a lot more prevalent on YouTube as well. So you can check me out there. Um, but if you haven't seen me or but come to one of uh, these virtual events before, um, I'll tell you a little bit about my why, my reason for being here, how I kind of got to where I am today as I was a, a student for a very, very long time, like eight years I spent uh, at Car Carleton University really long time, um, but all good. We love to see it. I have a, a background in biology, which is like super broad, super general, but I actually studied entomology, the study of insects. Insects were my jam. Plants were also, also obviously my jam. They kind of coincide and go hand in hand, but I love all things green, growing, living, breathing on this wonderful place that we call home, planet Earth. Um, but I started the Urban Botanist right out of university like I came up with the idea and name for the company the same month that I was writing my final exams like quite literally started it the month that I graduated like finally after eight years of getting through and doing two undergrads um but I started it fresh out of university I kind of had this idea that I wanted to encourage and inspire people to engage with nature maybe you at home especially over the last two and a half years, especially over the winter. Hate to say the W word. I know that we're coming out of winter now. Spring is here. It has arrived. It is fully, truly here. I feel it 
deep inside me, our plants are feeling it, they're waking up, we're waking up. Um, but I, I really started the urban botanist for that reason of wanting to feel that connection with nature. And I myself at that time was feeling a little bit disconnected. And as I was saying, maybe you at home are too. And that can look like, you know, going days, weeks, God forbid, months without connecting with, with nature. And um, connecting with nature can be very simple, especially during the winter when we don't have our maybe nature trails that we tend to frequent as often. We don't have our cottage, our camping, our kayaking, all of those things that we love doing outside. But truly engaging with nature can be as simple as having one single house plant, okay, that we interact with on a regular basis that can really help to improve not only our physical spaces, but our mental and spiritual spaces as well. They Plants are scientifically proven to improve our moods, boost our moves, moods. Plants make people happy in so many words. It has been proven to not only increase your productivity, but also your creativity. It helps to uh, reduce anxiety, stress, um, chronic fatigue. There are some, you know, small little occurrences that you might be experiencing that are very easily getting swept under the rug. Maybe you're having chronic migraines, headaches, um, just an overall feeling of blah. And I invite you to look inwards and see if maybe it's been a while since you last connected with nature. Like you're probably wondering, okay, Emma, well, why is it so important that we connect with nature? Like, why is it that it has such a profound impact on our, on our lives, on our spaces, on our mindset? I'm going to tell you why. And it is such a huge reason for my being, at least I'll say, as, as being the urban botanist and why I'm here today is, is because we as human beings have an innate need to be close to nature. We need it. It is literally in our DNA literally lives within us. We have evolved alongside nature. And when we go too long without it, it can really start to have a negative effect on us. So yes, weekend at the cottage, great. Going for a four hour hike, awesome. But you don't need to do those things to feel those positive effects. You can have a couple house plants. Maybe you have a little herb garden. Of course, spring is here and our outdoor gardening can um, resume shortly at least but you can grow your plants inside. And that's really what uh, I'm all about is teaching people how to grow their indoor green thumbs of all shapes and sizes. So I welcome you here today and I celebrate you for carving a little hour out of your day to hopefully learn something new and to, uh, to water your own, your own selves. Because I like to say plant care is self-care in so many ways. And that's what we're going to be chatting about today. So as we may or may not know, I've done a few of these workshops for Algonquin um, College in the past, and um, I kind of like to open up the floor to see not only how many plant parents we have here, how many people here are plant parents. Let me know in the chat. The chat function is here for me to communicate with you folks, okay? So let me know how many people here are plant parents. Let's, let's get a number. Let's get a number. How many plants do we got? approximately. I couldn't even give you a number, if I'm being honest. I think I've maybe got like a hundred, if I were to guess, which sounds crazy. 50. Oh my gosh. Okay. We got 50. Carolina has 20. Gab has one. Amazing. Whoa. whoa someone said 300. You're joking. I need to see pictures of this. I've got to see this. Maria's got 30. Deb's got six. Manageable. I like that number. It's a lucky number. Six is my favorite number. Alexandra, Alexander has 18. Wow. Vini has eight. We've got some grand plants. Okay, maybe five. I like it. So we've got a lot of plant parents here. Anybody here have no plants at all? Safe space, safe space, I promise you. Let me know in the chat if you have no plants and you're here to figure out what plants to get. And if not, that's fine. Even if you've got a couple, you've got a couple scragglers, like Samantha's got a couple that are like hanging on there. That's fine. What I hope to do during this workshop is to see from you guys what you want to chat about. I obviously have a few topics that I think are great to cover, but let me know if there's something specific that you're hoping to learn more about. Is it repotting? Is it pest control? Is it watering techniques? Is it how to grow your plant collection on a budget? where to shop for plants, how to shop for plants. 
plants to avoid, the best plants for beginners. We've got repotting and watering. Watering would be great, okay. Everything, man, got you. Lavender keeps dying. Okay, the best plants for indoor and easy to take care of. Got it. When to repot, touch on them all. Great. Well, luckily I'm gonna to touch on them all as best I can. Pests, okay, spider mites and scale bugs. Got it. I'm gonna chat about most of these things. I'm gonna try and cram as much as possible into an hour because truly I could talk about all the things for hours on end, for days on end, my God. Um, but I'll try to cover some of like those hot topics that people like to learn about. And if you have specific questions, fire them into the chat. I have it open. I can read them. Um, but I'll also save the last sort of 10, 15 minutes for just general Q&A. If you've got a question specific to a plant that you have at home, whatever that might be, whatever that might look like, we will reserve the last 10 to 15 minutes for those questions. You can also send me a DM on Instagram. I'm at the urban botanist. Check me out there. I'm always posting like videos, tips, tricks, and beyond for all things under the green thumb gardening umbrella. Okay. So we're going to get you sorted here today. Okay. Another question from another Emma. Uh, how do I identify a particular plant? I have a tree that I think is a ficus, but not sure. Okay. So actually, how about I start there? identifying your plants, maybe even identifying plants that you're out, you're at a garden center, you're at Home Depot, you're like, oh, this is a really cool plant, but it just says tropical four inch on the sticker and I don't know what it is. Or maybe you're at Canadian Tire one day, you're there to pick up air filters for your place, you're there to pick up something else completely non-plant related, but you walk by that plant section and you're like, oh, do I need one? No, but am I getting one? Yes. You bring it home and you have no idea what it is. Let's talk about the ways that you can identify plants. So of course, for starters, hopefully there's a tag. That's kind of a given. But an app that I like to use, and I'm not sponsored in any way, it's legitimately the app that I use. It's on Androids, it's on iPhones. It's called Picture This. I'm pretty sure it's on Androids. It's 100% on iPhones. Picture This. It's a free app. Download it. It's amazing. It's actually pretty spot on for identifying plants. You can literally take your phone, take a picture of the plant, and it'll tell you exactly what that plant is. And it also um, saves all of your plants for you. So you end up with sort of like this scrapbook of all the plants that you've either seen, maybe you're out on a trail, maybe you're on a holiday, you're on a trip somewhere, and you wanted to see, oh, what kind of plant is this? It saves them and categorizes them for you and tells you a little bit of the natural history on that plant, watering tips and all that. So it's a pretty fabulous app. Highly recommend for identifying your plants at home. Um, so that's what I would recommend for that. Let's talk about repotting. It's spring. Uh, some of the things that you can start thinking about or doing for your houseplants at home, one of those being repotting. When it comes to repotting, something that you never want to do when you're repotting your houseplants is you never want to repot during the fall and winter months. Don't do it. Another thing you don't really want to do, you could do it maybe once or twice during the fall and winter, is fertilize. There are some things, some techniques that are saved for the spring, summer growing months for plants and some things that you want to avoid. So of course we're coming out of winter. You don't ever want to repot your plants during the winter if you can avoid it. If you can avoid it, you want to save it for right now. Our days are starting to get longer. We just had our time change a few weeks ago and our plants are starting to wake up, quite literally wake up. And if you repot your plants during the winter months, you can actually stress them out. You can kind of take them out of that dormancy cycle that they're in and really stress them out and cause them to potentially even um, get really stressed out and die. So we wanna save our repotting for spring. Now, do we repot every spring? No, not necessarily. My rule of thumb, and I'm gonna share with you a few tips of two. I call them my, my tips of two. My rule of thumb for repotting is every two years. So if you're wondering, should I repot? Does this plant need to be repotted? I don't know. Has it been two years? That's typically the sweet time, the sweet point for when you wanna repot your plants. Not only because chances are your plant probably needs more room, more space, 
But another thing that our plants need that not a lot of people realize is yes, they need sunlight. Yes, they need water to grow. But plants also need nutrients and minerals. And where do they get those nutrients and minerals from? The soil. Soil. So whenever you're repotting your plants, you want to make sure that you are using new, fresh soil. Because fresh soil means fresh nutrients, new nutrients, which is another thing that after two years has become quite depleted, especially if you're not fertilizing regularly. So I always like to use fresh, new, sterile soil whenever you're repotting your plants. Now, what does that mean? Bagged soil. If you've got a bag of soil that maybe you used half of, you rolled it up, you stored it in your garage over the winter, you can reuse that, no worries. I always recommend you roll up and store your soil correctly so that insects aren't getting in there, laying their eggs and becoming a potential issue further down the line. You don't ever really wanna use outdoor soil. I like to keep outdoor soil for my outdoor plants. Indoor soil for my indoor plants. For obvious reasons, you don't want to be bringing insects inside. Insects lay their eggs, they've got juveniles, they've got pupae, they've got all different types of things happening inside the soil that you don't want to bring indoors to your inside plants, okay? Outdoor soil can also potentially, depending on where it came from, have um, in, uh, seeds, invasive weed seeds that you could be introducing to your gardens, your container gardens, your indoor house plants. Um, also, I've, I've had people ask, well, what if I see a big old pile of soil, big old pile of dirt on the side of the road? Can I snag some of that and take it home? And to that, I say no, not only because private property, theft, stealing, grand arsony, we don't want to go to jail. I'm kidding. Probably wouldn't, but you know, not yours, leave it there. But more importantly, you don't know what the history of that soil is. There could be chemicals inside that soil. We don't know what its history is and you could be introducing that to your plants. Um, you don't wanna introduce that of course to your edible gardens as well. Stuff that you want to be consuming, no good. So soil is very important. Obviously you always wanna be using soil that's specific to the type of plant that you are repotting. So if you're African orchids you can, or African violets, you would use African violet soil. If you're working with orchids, you wanna use an orchid substrate, really barky, cocoa core mixture. But if you're kind of just growing whatever and you're like, eh, I don't know, I'm just growing whatever. A high grade potting soil works just fine. All right. So repotting is every two years. Now, um, how do we repot? What does repotting look like? For starters, I like to make sure I've got a great big old space that I can make a big mess. Get a tarp, get like an old um, linen sheet towel i never throw that stuff out because i'm like look i'm going to use it i will use it for my repotting i've got great big plants that i need a lot of space to repot and when you've got more freedom to like make a mess i find it's a lot more enjoyable because you're not feeling like restricted of like oh i don't want to make a mess here so set up your space you really want to intentionally set up your space for when you're repotting so repotting would mean have a good space have new soil and have an appropriately sized pot. Now, what does an appropriately sized pot look like? So this is another rule of two that I like to use, and that's two inches in diameter. So if we look at a pot, I use this guy for reference. This is a four inch size pot. Plants are measured typically in increments of two. This is a four inch, two inch, six inch, eight inch, 10 inch, and so on. So a four inch size pot that looks something like this, if you're repotting a four inch plant, you wanna make sure that you are repotting them into a six inch pot. So one that is just slightly larger. There's a six inch pot here. Just to show you for reference. Four inch, six inch. So the diameter is larger by two inches. You don't wanna put a two inch plant, this is a two inch, inside of a six inch. Already that's kind of a red flag, that don't look right. That's not right. There's too much space, there's too much soil, you're gonna end up overwatering your plant because you're like, well, there's a lot of soil here, I'm gonna water, water, water. But that's too much water for this plant to absorb and that's too much soil to dry out in between waterings that you end up overwatering and killing your plant. So. Selecting the appropriate size pot is really crucial and really important whenever you're repotting your plants, okay? What about pots that don't have drainage holes? 
That's a question I get a lot too. Anybody have really beautiful decorative pots that don't have these little guys in the bottom? Drainage holes? Yep. Ever wonder what to do about that? How many people here use gravel in the bottom of their pots? Layer of gravel. Some people drill holes. Great. Christina does. Gabby's wondering what's it for. I'm going to chat about that. So drainage, drainage, drainage. What is drainage? Let's talk, chat about drainage. Drainage holes are these holes that you see in the bottom of pots. They're also what you see in the bottom of your house plants, in the plastic pots that you pick your house plant up from when you go out and buy it from the nursery, from wherever you're getting it. There's holes in the bottom of those pots. See those holes? Those are there for a reason. A lot of people feel like when they bring their plant home, they've got to repot it right away. They've got to get it out of this plastic container. It's bad for the plant. This is not true. You can repot into larger plastic pots. These are called nursery pots and they are literally designed for plants to grow in. Like they're completely fine. Most importantly, because they have these drainage holes. Drainage holes are there. And I'm going to do a little demonstration here. Drainage holes are so that when you're watering your plants, see I'm watering my plant here. I'm gonna water it to the point where water's stripping out the bottom. This is in fact the correct way to water all of your house plants. You wanna water all of your house plants to the point where water is dripping out the bottom. See it's now drip, drip, dripping dry, drip, drip, drip. It's allowing that excess water to drip down, out, and away from the roots. Because roots, as some of us may know or not know, roots need oxygen just as much as they need soil and they need water. And when roots sit in too much water for too long or really soggy soil in a pot that doesn't have drainage, they become suffocated. And that's what that's how root rot happens, okay? So this is the best way to ensure that not only you are watering your plant deeply, all the way through deep, deep, deeply, it's a great way to be a little bit more hands off when it comes to watering your plants. When you're watering this deeply, it means you don't have to water every day. In some cases, it means you don't even have to water every week. And plants prefer to be watered good and deep like this, allow drainage to happen. And then let's say you've got a pot that has no drainage holes, you can see here, I just placed my plant right back in that beautiful pot. I'm not repotting this plant into this pot. I'm leaving it in that plastic nursery pot because of the lack of drainage. However, if you do have a, a pot that does have drainage, you can pot that plant up right directly into that pot, no worries. And then water to the point where again, water is dripping out the bottom. All right, how do we know when to water? Emma, that looks like a lot of water. I thought that that's too much water. Is that not going to end up overwatering my plant? Here's another rule of two I'm going to share with you. So the first rule of tool was two is every two years for repotting your plants. The other rule of two was going up in two inches in diameter size for when you're repotting. So you don't want to go too big. And of course, you don't want to go too small. It's going to end up being redundant. Your plant's not going to have as much space to grow. However, that being said, if you don't have a lot of space and you don't really want your plant to be growing huge because the more space you give your plant, the bigger it's gonna get. I still recommend that you repot every two years. Even if you're repotting that same plant back into the same pot, maybe you like the size it is, you don't have as much space, you wanna keep the pot, you wanna keep reusing the pot. It's still good to provide new fresh nutrients to your plant, fresh soil, it's all good. It's gonna keep your plant healthy at the very least. But my other rule of two is two, my two knuckle rule, where I'll stick my finger in the soil, right deep into the soil of my plant, and I'm sticking it up to the second knuckle. And this is gonna help me know when it's time to water again. I don't, I mean, everyone, you guys do your thing. If you've got your process where you water on Wednesdays or every second Friday is your day that you water, Whatever is working for you, you keep doing that by all means. We are all our own urban botanists, our own urban horticulturalists, and our plants are always evolving and adapting to 
suit our spaces, right? But what this two knuckle rule does is it helps us to determine how dry that soil is. Because when you're watering deeply like that, you don't wanna do that every day. You don't wanna do that every week. You only wanna do that when the top two inches, two to three inches of your potted plant, of your soil is dry. So when that's dry, the best way to tell is sticking your finger in there. There are moisture meters that you can buy and do, but we have our own built-in moisture meter. It's our finger, okay? We want to make sure that, that those top two inches are dry before we take our plant out of its decorative pot, or if it's potted already in a pot that's got drainage holes, that's fine. Bring it over to your sink, water it to the point where it's fully, thoroughly watered and water's dripping out the bottom. I could do this all day. I mean, I won't, but because I'm letting that drainage happen, it's all good. It means that the soil has absorbed the exact amount that it's able to absorb. It's maxed out its absorption. And then I can place that plant back there. Why am I doing it out here and not just in the pot? Well, of course, because where's all that water going? To the bottom of the pot. So where are those roots gonna be sitting? in stagnant gross water. No good, we don't want that to happen. So this is the best way to water your plants, okay? Take it out. And a great way to engage with your plants too, doing that two knuckle rule, sticking your finger in once a week, once every couple of days. If you're like me or like some other folks here that have 50 plus plants, it's a great way to check in on them. Even if you've got six plants, even if you've got three plants, Check in on your plant. Stick your finger in that soil. Check in on yourself. Take a minute. I call this pausing with plants. Take a freaking minute. Take a minute for yourself. You need it. You deserve it. Check in on your plant. Does it need anything? Maybe you're just about to go water and you're feeling that soil and you're like, oh, that's feeling actually pretty soggy. Wait a minute. What did Emma say? To wait? Okay, I'll wait. And then a week goes by and then a month goes by and then several months go by and your plant is flourishing. It's opening up a new leaf. Maybe it's flowering. All the awesome things that plants do that light us up, that make us feel a certain type of way start happening because we're more in tuned with what our plant needs because we're doing that physical touch, seeing if it needs something from us instead of just absentmindedly going on autopilot, going around watering on whatever day of the week. I invite you to pause, check in on that plant. Emma is asking how often should aloe vera plants be watered? Let's, uh, let's move into aloe vera and succulents, cacti. How many people here have succulents and cacti? Let me know. Lots of succulents, lots, lots, lots. I love it, I love it. Succulents are super popular. They become super popular after the, over the last few years. And rightfully so, they're adorable. They're so cute. They have this like perfect rosette shape and form. I've got a little succulent right here. They've got these thick, beautiful, fleshy leaves and they're relatively easy to find and inexpensive. Now, how many people here have killed a succulent? Let me ask that. Me too. Me too. Safe space. Safe space. Okay. This is a safe space. Okay. We killed 10. I've killed my fair share. String of pearls. Anyone? The worst. The worst. I don't know what it is about string of pearls, but they hate me and I hate them back. No, I, lo I, I love them, but they just don't love me. I don't get it, but try and try again. The thing about succulents and very similar to the two knuckle rule. Now that two knuckle rule will work with just about any plant, any house plant that works great with. But when it comes to your succulents and seeing those cacti, when it comes to succulents and cacti, one really interesting thing to note about these plants is obviously look at their big, thick, fleshy bodies. They're really succulent, thick, fleshy bodies. That is quite literally a water reserve. It's like a camel's hump. Each leaf is kind of like a camel hump. It's storing water. That's a really good indication to us that these plants don't need to be watered very often. 
They don't need to be watered every day. They don't even need to be watered every week. I don't remember the last time I watered this cactus. It's probably been like two months straight up. Maybe I'll water it today. He's bone dry. If I were to feel this soil, I will. Bone dry, dry all the way to the bottom. And that's how you water cacti and succulents. Not two inches, the whole way has gotta be dry. Bone dry for cacti and succulents, whether that's two weeks for you, whether that's one month, I'm not gonna put a number on it because everyone's space is different, right? My space may have more humidity than uh, Samantha's space. Samantha's space may have more uh, natural light or south facing windows than Maria's space. Like everyone's space is different. Our humidity levels, our dryness, and our plants are always evolving and adapting to suit our spaces, right? So the best way to tell if your plant needs water is that soil. It's the soil. It's not the leaves. It's not the, obviously plants will tell you if they're sad and they need a drink, they're looking a little deflated, they need water, but the soil is going to be the best indicator for you. Succulents and cacti like to dry out completely before being watered again. And when you do water them, let's think about where a cactus grows. Cacti and succulents grow in very similar conditions, very similar ecosystems. The desert, right? Very just dry, arid ecosystem. Does it rain every day in the desert? No, it doesn't. It doesn't even rain every week in the desert. Now, how about when it does rain in the desert? Does it kind of just little spray, little, little spritz? Definitely not. Uh, no, exactly. When it rains, it pours. That's right, Gabby. Gabby knows. When it comes down, it comes down hard. So when you do water your succulents and cacti, and this is kind of a misconception that exists with um, cacti and succulents, is that they don't like water. It's not really the right way to word it. They need a good, deep watering. I'm going to water this guy super deeply. Probably due for a repot. It's been at least two years. And I can tell because the soil just isn't looking as full as nutritious. It's maybe looking a little bit hard. Maybe it's looking really like fluffy and just icky. Need new soil. But succulents and cacti like to be watered deeply. Again, think about that torrential downpour. All of all houseplants are domesticated at the end of the day, right? Like they exist naturally in nature somewhere. And we're always trying to replicate that habitat indoors because that's obviously how they're going to grow. The cactus isn't going to do well in a low lit space with high humidity because cacti don't grow in a rainforest type ecosystem. They grow somewhere where it's a little bit drier, lots of sun. So we're trying to replicate that, right? And we want to do that as well when it comes to our care methods. So what does that look like in terms of watering? Well, they live in the desert and it doesn't rain every day in the desert. So therefore I'm not going to water my cactus every day. That's kind of how I look at it. That makes sense. So when you do water your succulents and cacti, you wanna make sure that you're only watering them when the soil has completely and totally dried out from top to bottom, okay? Uh, Mon Monica, I think is that, Mo Morea, is asking uh, best care for a jade plant. A jade plant is a succulent. So what I just said there about watering. Lots of sun, good bright sun. Bright, direct sunlight is great. And you only wanna water when the soil is dried out. Aloe vera, same thing. Aloe vera is those big, thick, fleshy leaves, very succulent in nature. Typically grows in a really dry, arid ecosystem. You only want to water an aloe vera when it's totally dried out. Okay. All right, let's talk about having some questions come in. Mm, Maria says that the jade started growing white, dusty spots. That sounds like mealybugs to me. That sounds like mealybugs to me. All right, let's talk about a starter plant because I'm seeing a few people asking about starter plants. Maria, I'll talk about what you can do for your mealybugs. We'll talk about pest control next. Let's talk about good beginner plants, low light loving plants, plants that can do well in lower lit spaces. 
Um, this is one of those. This is called a ZZ plant. Does this look familiar to some people? This is gonna be a great one for your office that doesn't have any direct sunlight. ZZ or Zanzibar gem. Ooh, Brennan just got a black one, a ZZ raven. Gorgeous, rare plant collector here. I love it. Yes, they come in black and they're called um, ZZ ravens. I've, I've had them on the Urban Bonus website a few times and at some of our pop-ups, if I'm lucky enough to source enough to sell, they're really cool looking. Um, you can get these in all different sizes. This is, a, this is, of course, a small one, but they come in medium, great big sizes. They're great for a floor if you want one to like make a statement in the corner of your space. But these are low light loving plants or low light tolerant plants, I should say. They can tolerate low lit spaces. They're also very succulent in nature. They've got like a waxy leaf, big thick stem. Um, so these plants are extremely low maintenance. You only need to water them similar to a cactus when the soil totally dries out. This guy needs a watering, so I'm gonna water it. So you can see again how I water my plants. Look at all that water pouring out the bottom. Beautiful, this plant's gonna love that. Good deep watering, okay. These plants are great for low lit spaces. Another great plant is called a snake plant, Sansevieria. Do I have one? It's too far for me to grab. Snake plants are another great low, lit, uh, low light loving plant. So snake plant, ZZ plant. Another one is called a peace lily, Spathiphyllum. They've got those beautiful white lilies. You usually see them at like airports, uh, shopping centers because they're low maintenance as well. Uh, so you can write that one down. And then another one would be a pothos, a classic pothos. They look very similar to this guy up here. They kind of have this like nice, long, dangling, cascading growth. Great plants for, uh, for low lit spaces. Okay. Let's see what this question is. Ka, any advice on how to grow strawberries from dried bulbs? Oof, okay, got a lot here. Let's see. Um, what is the lily plant name? It's called a peace lily or a spathiphyllum. S-P-A-T-H-I-P-H-Y-L-L. -L. Spathiphyllum, U-M. Spathiphyllum. Um, okay, I'm going to read through. I, I won't touch on strawberries only because I uh, probably don't have the answers you need for strawberries. Um, unfortunately, sorry, but let's just see if I can pull out any of these other questions here that I maybe missed. I'll talk about pest control, okay? I will talk about pest control because I think maybe a few people here have, are, if you're plant parents, if you haven't dealt with it yet, it's only a matter of time. And it doesn't make you a bad plant parent, doesn't mean that you did anything wrong. It's just that insects have legs, they have wings, they're small, they're incredibly resilient, and they have co-evolved alongside plants. This is their home, this is their food, this is their shelter. So wherever plants are, they come hand in hand with bugs. They come hand in hand with insects, and it's just the way it is, and it's all good. But we want to keep an eye on our plants to make sure that we're nipping those pests in the butt. You can check out my Instagram story from today. I found some thrips or one of those pests. Uh, are these thrips on the front? No, these are aphids. Thrips are a small little insect that are brutal. How many people here have had thrips before? Yes, this is a monstera for those people asking. Monstera deliciosa. Also had a pretty bad rip attack. Some bad leaves here, you can see right there too. Jerks. They are not like fruit flies, no. We can talk about those too. Those little fruit flies that you see flying around. Those are called fungus gnats. They look like fruit flies. They're like those little tiny, gross, annoying. They fly up your nose. They're freaking just everywhere and annoying. Those are called fungus gnats. They're a type of a fly. They're not quite fruit flies, but fungus gnats are kind of, in my opinion, the most 
common pest, but even though they're annoying because they're flying around and they're not so visually appealing, they are the least destructive to your pet plants. They're the least destructive, but a, a few ways to deal with pests. So for starters, persistence is the name of the game when it comes to combating any houseplant pests, whether it's fungus gnats, whether it's spider mites, Spider mites are a tiny little mite that can do real, really big harm. They're a little tiny mite um, and can easily be missed because they are so small and they make this webbing on your plants, usually on the rib of your plant, usually uh, between the leaves, they'll start to form these really delicate and small webs that to look at it quickly, when you're not doing your daily pause with your plants, that pause not only is great for, for knowing when to water or, or uh, seeing if the water watering is necessary, but it's also great for checking to see if there's any insect activity. Are there any little spots? Can you actually physically see insects? Are you noticing any little webs? Because I'm telling you, if you look a little closer at those webs, you'll see some little spots. And if you focus your eyes even a few seconds longer on those spots, you'll see that they're moving. Those are spider mites and they are the bane of my existence. Just kidding, I don't have them that bad. I have had, we've all had, if you're a plant parent, you've had infestations and you just gotta be on top of it. You gotta be equipped. We'll talk about the equipment that I use for combating pests, but uh, thrips are one. Thrips are a little tiny, Juveniles look like these light, almost yellow colored, skinny, long bug. They've got a straw as a mouth part, proboscis, and they quite literally suck the nutritional juices out of your plants. So your plants will start looking yellow. You'll maybe see like brown edging, maybe almost like a mosaic pattern. See this like brown yuckiness? Um, curling of the leaves, your plant just doesn't look happy. And you're like, I don't know what's wrong with my plant. What's wrong with it? I'm watering it, it's getting sunlight. I repotted it, I'm giving it love, I'm doing everything. Maybe it's time to look a little bit closer and investigate and see if there's some insect activity going on. So there's thrips, there's spider mites, there's mealybugs, which could be those cottony white spots that you're seeing. That's not your plant growing those, those are a pest. If you're noticing white little, white little uh, fluffy spots, those are a pest called mealybugs, very similar to thrips in that they've got a proboscis and they're sucking the nutritional juices out of your plant, gross. Scale is another one, scale bugs. Scale, I don't mind so bad, mostly because at least for me, they're easy to spot. They look like little brown bumps on the leaf, they're very common in thickest plants, thickest uh, elastic plants, rubber trees, thickest elastica. Here's a little tiny thickest plant. This is a thickest triangularis, in desperate need of a watering. Um, scale bugs are easy to get off because I find you can scrape them off. You can use rubbing alcohol and just Q-tip Q-tip them off. Um, what other pests are there? Fungus gnats. So it's the mosquito for plants, not really. Yes, actually, I love that. The mosquito for plants, absolutely. Can you get ladybugs to eat the spider mites? Do ladybugs eat spider mites? I think they do. You'd have to release them indoors, which I've actually done and it's fine, I don't mind. Um, Ladybugs are good for definitely thrips. They're great for aphids, obviously. They're the best for aphid infestations. That's another nasty bug that you can get. You can get root aphids, you can get, I've only had aphid problems on my outdoor plants. Um, da, 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 sorry, I'm just reading this. We can talk about orchids. I have a full video on my YouTube channel about orchids. That's super helpful. Um, but yes, pests, 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 persistence.
persistence. And that means keeping on it, spraying, hosing them down. The first thing that I do whenever I see pests on my plant, I bring them over to my sink. I bring them to my shower, depending on how big the plant is. And I literally hose it down because even just water pressure will get a lot of those insects, bugs, eggs. It'll wash a lot of the, a, a, a whole lot of it away at least. And that go, everyone's got access, luckily, gratefully to water here in Ottawa at least. So you can do a good spray down, spray them outside, spray them in your sink, hose them down. And then you want to look at using an insecticidal soap, for example. This is one method. There's multiple methods that you can use. Insecticidal soap is one. This is a Safer's brand. You can get it very easily. Uh, garden centers, Home Depot, Amazon probably. This is a concentrate. So you would dilute this into a bottle with water. And then what you do, and I even do this with plants that don't have any insect activity happening. I do, I use it as a preventative measure is you just spray. I spray the back of the leaves first. I spray the front of the leaves too. But the back of the leaves is mostly where plant pests like to hang out. Thrips are always hiding on the back end because insects are smart. They know they're not gonna be seen on the back of the leaf. That's an evolutionary adaptation. They know what they're doing. They're gonna hide on the back of the leaf. They're gonna hide in the crevices. They're gonna hide in the stems. They're gonna hide on the pedials. They're gonna hide in little inconspicuous spots of your plant. So it's good to give your plant a full thorough spraying with your spray bottle, okay? Now you'll notice, you probably won't notice, but I'm gonna tell you this. This is the only time that I spray my plants. I don't, I've got this little cute spray bottle. It's honestly more for demonstration and for look because it's like cute and vintage and I love green. I don't spray my plants for humidity. You might think you're providing humidity to your plants, but it's not doing what you think it's doing. In fact, it can be counterproductive. It can be, it can have a negative effect on your house plants, spraying them. How many people here spray their plants? spray your ferns. Maybe it's part of your daily routine where you just go around and spray everything. Now, if you're doing that and it works for you by all means, but I actually like to recommend against spraying your plants with water. The only time I spray my plants is when I'm doing a treatment, when I'm managing pests. And the reason for that is because Plants are not absorbing water through their leaves, not as efficiently or effectively at least. They're absorbing water through their roots. So if you're doing it for watering purposes, just water your plant normally. If you're doing it to introduce humidity, it's not really doing what you think it's doing. It's not, it's not providing sufficient humidity to truly make a difference. There's other ways that you can provide humidity. Obviously a humidifier works great. You can find pretty awesome humidifiers at the thrift store. I, my humidifier I got for 10 or 15 bucks at Value Village works perfect. Get yourself a humidifier. Those actually work. They do. I think I even have a little one. I do. I've got this little mini humidifier that you can just stick in a cup of water. This is called Atmofix, A-T-M-O-F-I-X, Atmofix, not sponsored, but it just plugs into USB and it humidifies, you know, small little part if you're working with a smaller space. It's a great little humidifier, Atmofix, cool little dude. The reason why I don't recommend you spraying your plants is because when the water gets trapped in certain parts of the leaf, Maybe it's not draining properly. Um, it's, it's a perfect opportunity for bacteria growth, okay? Fungus. Um, really, it's just, it's a, it's a potential housing ground for bacteria to grow. So I don't spray my plants. I really don't. I do not do the spritz. If I want to introduce humidity, I use a humidifier. Or if you really want to keep it simple and hands off, this tray of pebbles that I have here is my humidifier tray. This is a, a type of anthurium. They love humidity. They've got these really beautiful aerial roots. 
It's a bird's nest anthurium, anthurium superbum. And this is what this is how I have this plant on my shelf. I have this little tray of, of gravel of pebbles. I fill it with, with water, place my plant on top, and slowly over time, like it'd probably take four or five days for this amount of water. I, I fill up the tray with water. It's already been filled up pretty well through my demonstrations. This is going to slowly release water and create sort of like a tiny microclimate, little tiny space where the humidity is just marginally higher than the rest of my space. So this little technique works great if you've got moisture loving plants, orchids love humidity. Orchids have these beautiful aerial roots, very similar. And um, those roots need oxygen. They need, need, need oxygen. If you've got, if you've got orchids, you really want to be careful that you're not overwatering. Okay, you want to make sure that there's lots of good airflow. They're in the right growing substrate, a really good airy, um, well-draining mixture to grow in. But orchids are a whole other topic of discussion. Um, but this is how I introduce humidity. All right. And the only time I said, like I said, uh, that I spray my plants is when I'm doing a treatment. This is another pest control um, product that I've used, spider mite knockout. This is a pyre pyrethine, it's a little bit stronger. Um, I only use this in really, really bad infestations. Um, you can use it on your outdoor plants if you want. I don't use this on anything that I'm consuming. I don't use it on cannabis. I don't use it on tomatoes. I don't use it on anything that I'm going to be consuming in any way because it's pyrethine. It's not organic. It's not natural. And that's just my jam. That's just how I roll. But something else you can use is called neem oil. This is neem oil. And it's like this brown, it's like this brown thick oil and I'll put it in a spray bottle I'll just do it right now because why not I've got some pests that I got to deal with I'll put it in a spray bottle and I'll dilute that spray bottle with water that's a really weird smell has anyone ever worked with neem oil before it's like really got a weird, I don't know what it smells like. A lot of people don't like the smell and honestly, I can see why it's kind of like, I don't know what it is, it's weird. It's a weird scent. You can get neem oil at most garden centers. Uh, where's the water? Most garden centers, you can get it, I think probably on Amazon, um, but this is a natural, product that I like to use. And it's great for prevention too. Um, I've even diluted a small amount of neem oil into my watering can and I've watered my plants with it because they end up taking it up into their, um, in, into their root system, into their, um, their system. The word is escaping me right now. And bugs don't like it. So insects will naturally not want to attack a plant that has neem, neem oil in its system. I literally just add it to water, I shake it. You can add a drop or two of Dawn dish detergent, a really mild dish detergent because it'll help to um, emulsify everything. And then I'll spray my plants with this too. Neem oil, you can never use too much of. It's not gonna burn your plant, kind of like this stuff can do. But just like I already said, and the same with any, anything else for, um, for your plants is you want to do this consistently to not only keep the thrips away because a lot of these insects, they've laid eggs somewhere. So yeah, sure, you've killed the adults, but there's still the eggs, the pupae that you want to make sure that you're combating too. Um, which actually I'll talk about fungus gnats because those are pretty common. Fungus gnats people have, they're those little flies flying around, super annoying. They, they feed on the fungus that's around the roots of your plant. So a really bad fungus gnat infestation can be detrimental, but it's gotta be really bad. 
and your plant's going to be suffering. So when you're seeing those little flies flying around, uh, have, has anyone ever used those sticky traps? They're like a yellow sticky trap that you put in your, yeah, that you put in your plant and flies get stuck to them. Sure. Is, does it work? Yeah. Is it functional? Does it capture adults? Yes. But that's all it's capturing are the adults. When it's not capturing, or what are those adults doing? The adults are going right back to that soil and laying eggs and new adults are emerging. So with fungus gnats, what I like to recommend you do, where is, what I like to recommend you do is very simply, and another way that you can use gravel or pea stone is you can put a layer of stone on top of your house plants, right on top. Just cover the top layer in gravel, in decorative stone, aquarium gravel, decorative gravel, cover that layer. And what that's gonna do is it's going to prevent new adults from emerging from the soil. And it's gonna keep those adults that are flying around from going back to the soil and laying more eggs. Also helps to keep moisture in. It's good for lots of things. It's also a nice little look, kind of nice, pretty way to add a little certain something to the top of your plants. So that's what I recommend for fungus gnats, okay? Uh, let's see, questions here. She had mentioned a drop of Dawn dish instead of oil, if you wish. Okay, if you wanna make your own insecticidal soap, you can, I've made my own. I have my own that I need right here. <laughs> what did I use to make this? Baking soda. You can look up natural DIY um, insecticidal soap. We probably all have the ingredients that we need at home. Baking soda and water and a little bit of Dawn dish detergent. I also put a little bit of neem oil in because I have neem oil. Shake it up, do a little test spot. I always like to do a little test spot first, kind of like what you would do if you're using a new skin product to make sure that your plant isn't gonna have like a seriously adverse reaction to it. You can make your own at home, absolutely. Ah, okay. Laura's had a lot of fungus gnats and realized there's a bag of soil. Fungus gnats also thrive in moist conditions. So typically people that overwater their plants tend to have a lot of fungus gnats. If you let that top two inches of soil dry out, the eggs dry out, the adults won't lay their eggs there. And it kind of helps to also manage that biome of not having pests. Okay, where are we at with time? I was going off on a tangent there. We're at two o'clock. That's okay. We're going to save time for questions, okay? And I think, questions. Yeah, go ahead. I think we have time for like one more question, Emma. So this one was kind of more general. So let's go to this one. So I think it was the other Emma that asked. Um, just one second here. I'm just looking for it. Um, okay, so Emma asked. Um, she asked, what do we do about watering our plants when we're going away for two weeks or longer? So she says that she's killed plants by leaving them for a long time. So especially now that we're getting back to like traveling and going out, what would you recommend for like watering our plants for a long period of time? That's a great question. And annoyingly, I just moved the thing that I use a little bit out of reach, but I'll explain it to you. I'll describe it to you. And um, maybe I'll post a picture about it on my Instagram after so you can see what it actually looks like. Uh, so first things first, and kind of something we already discussed and covered, is watering your plants deeply. When you water your plant this deep, you can go a week. You can absolutely go a week if you've watered your plants very deeply. It might just mean that when you get back, you really got to water them straight away. Um, so that's one way you can do it. You can get something called a watering mat, where it's this like felt mat that has a water reserve. And through something that's called capillary action, meaning osmotic pressure, the plant pulling from the mat when it needs it. So you would have to place the plant 
with drainage holes directly on the mat itself. It's called a watering mat or a capillary mat. The plant will water itself as it needs it. That's one, one thing that you can try too. The other thing and what I was mentioning I have here, and what I use are, are called watering spikes. You can, get them at, um, you can get them at Lee Valley Tools. And um, Lee Valley Tools has them, they're like $6 a spike. And what they do is you can stick the spike right into the soil and it's got a, uh, like a hose. And then you stick that hose, it's more like a straw into a water reservoir, into a cup of water. And again, through capillary action, as the soil dries out and through osmotic pressure, it pulls water into the plant and it self waters your plant. So those are what I would recommend if you're going away for a week, two weeks, either deeply water your plants, try a capillary mat, they're not very expensive, or try a watering spike. Watering spikes are very inexpensive and easy to find. Lee Valley Tools, we've got one here in Ottawa. Online, you can find them surely, but um, hopefully, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you so much, Emma. And folks, we've run out of time and we have a ton of questions, so please, reach out to Emma on our social media as we will share her socials in the chat, um, send her a DM and just check out her YouTube channel. She has lots of videos there with a lot of answers to your questions. Check out her YouTube. She makes a lot of videos with posts of photos and also TikTok Emma. So I just want to say thank you so much, Emma. That was really great. And we really appreciate having you. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you are going to be the best plant parent that you can be. And have a great rest of your day, folks. Thank you, Emma. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a fabulous day. Thank you, Emma. Bye, folks. Bye, everyone.